I've actually stopped thinking about the relationship between myself and the work. Um, it's obviously, I mean, anybody that makes work, artwork, invests an element of themselves in the work. I, I really believe that. I mean, if, you, if there's none of you in the work, then I wouldn't regard it as art. I'd regard it as craft. And I think a lot of good craft has an enormous amount of the crafts person in the work too. Um, don't get me wrong. And I think technique and craft is enormously important. You can't make anything without knowing how. But um, in my case, I think, because I came out of a university environment as originally a conventional music composer, I was regarded as a composer, then this whole business of using narrative and using my own personal history and using my own spoken voice and so forth was regarded with suspicion by not so much my colleagues but by the outer layer of uh, music critics and commentators. Um, and there was a long period of time when, you know, the question was always, you're actually a professional narcissist, you know, and that was a criticism. Narcissism is regarded as, you know, being self-indulgent and um, so personalised that it's not accessible to anybody else. And I used to worry about that a lot, actually. Um, but with my experience of the work, not just here, but in, um, I don't know, half a dozen different, different countries now, um, repeated exposures, there doesn't seem to be a problem. People respond. And uh, there's nothing I can do about it anyway. Every now and then I try and make a completely abstract work. You know, I think I'm not going to use my voice, I'm not going to use a scenario, I'm just going to use sounds. And I have the technique and the instrument to do it. I can do it. But I've come to the conclusion that noise spectra don't function hierarchically. In other words, if you take noise A, noise B, and noise C, and you change their order, you just get a different order of the noises. There's no primary reason that noise A should always be there and noise B always there. They can be shifted in whatever differing arrangement you like, and it's just a different arrangement. And it doesn't refer to any overarching fundamental, and this was my whole difficulty with dodecaphonic systems, because the diatonic scale is a hierarchy. All the notes of the scale refer to the tonic, and if you change their order, they all refer to the tonic, but in a different permutation. And that's what makes them so powerful. If you destroy that, they just become integers which can be shifted into any permutation you like, and all you get is a different permutation. And that's meaningless. It's like having a whole lot of words which can all be in whatever order you like and it doesn't really matter, they're just words. Now, maybe I've got it all wrong, I don't know. There are lots of people who seem to have responded to that kind of music and still do. But what they're responding to, I can't understand. I don't know what it is. It might be just... There are lots of other things about that process which are interesting. Lots of rhythmic flexibility, lots of new colours and so forth. But they're cosmetic. That's not what pitch-based music's about. Not when you have a look at the tonal system and how powerful that is. When you can remove the orchestration completely from a Mahler symphony and put it into a short score on the piano and it all works still. There's something deeper there. And I feel with noise spectra, you can't organise noises strategically to produce uh, an equivalent uh, effect as, for example, an interrupted cadence. Uh, you can't control expectations beyond immediate first order differences. Faster, slower, higher, lower, rougher, smoother. And then I used to use strategically. That's why with a huge amount 
of electroacoustic music that's based on abstract sound, you get about three and a half minutes in and you turn off. It doesn't matter how clever, for the first few minutes, if the person's really, really technically skillful, all kinds of stuff's going on, you think, shit, this is amazing. And then after a while, you go, you know, cross-eyed. And it's gone. You've, you've, it's it just, because it's not making any, you can't extrapolate from it. All you can do is just experience it. And when you think about the way you live your life, if you can't extrapolate from the present, from your present and past experiences into what might happen in the future, you go mad instantly. I mean, that expectational periplus going out is crucial for the way we function. I think. May, I, I don't know. May I just think. But that's, I can't see past that. And I also can't feel past it. You know, even when I try to get beyond it. With, with noise. And I don't just use noise, I use pitch a lot in all sorts of ways, drones and fundamentals. I use recorded music in all sorts of ways as sound sources. But in the end, either covertly or overtly, somewhere there needs to be something for a listener to hang their hat on. And it, and it needs to be in the work, not on the programme note, it needs to be in the work. Um, and so I've just sort of accepted that now, really. Um, and it, if it's a personal story about the first time my mum and dad met each other, well, you know, that may be personal, but it's also universal, too. People respond to stories. I mean, that's what happens in cinema all the time. It happens in novels you know I mean you're reading along and alongside the plot that you're reading about is your own plot you're linking it back to yourself all the time subliminally that's the way it works I mean if you didn't if you were a tabula rasa the plot would make no sense at all you know so um, I just think I'm working with materials in a way that I really do think noise is very close to cinema. I think that's why a narrative, implied or explicit, has to be there. You know, and there are a few films that I've seen that are plotless, and some of them are just various colours and so forth, and they don't work. It, I mean, you know, noises refer to their provenance. They refer to the thing that made them. When you hear a noise, you ask yourself the question, what made that noise? You can't help it. So the idea of reduced listening is, is such a fantasy. It's ridiculous. You can't do it. That's the whole problem. Because if someone gets a whole bundle of sounds and they treat them like they're just sounds, they don't have any reference, no sign roll, then very quickly they just become a bundle of, because you're attributing sign rolls to them flat out the whole time. And if that's not taken notice of by the composer, then very quickly you, it just becomes a nonsensical mush. So the sign role of the sound's crucial, if it's a noise. And then there's the role of semantic material, spoken word, which is a way of insinuating data into the, into the sound stream. Because you don't hear the voice as a noise, you hear it as data, information, concepts. That's hugely useful, valuable as the same role as dialogue in the cinema. So I think it's a genre that that suits acousmatic listening. There's no visible sound source, but the sound sources are referenced by every sound you hear, either directly or indirectly. And if you don't take notice of that fact, I think you're on a trip to nowhere. But maybe that's just self-justification, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, um, some composers, kind of, uh, more kind of uh, recently, especially in the UK, kind of, will kind of um, start with a particular sound, which is kind of somewhat abstract, mm -hmm. but kind of extrapolates a piece from that sound based off 
based on his own kind of internal logic. Yeah. So, I mean, do you see that as having the same problems as abstract music? Well, yes. Right. Um, do you know John T. Harrison's piece, Clang? Yes, yes. Made from uh, potlids. Mm. You know, it's wonderfully clever and, and, and seductive. But it misses the boat. Because what made the sound has to be taken into account. Otherwise, the sounds are insignificant. They're banal. Doesn't matter how clever they are, you know. What's necessary for that piece to work, in my opinion, I'm sorry, Jonty, is some kind of implied overt or covert scenario to do with this lid and its role for someone. What, what lids? They go on pots. What are pots for? Cooking. What, what happens when you cook? You eat. Company, people, warmth. Now, if those sounds in that piece could be manipulated or it could be given a bit of a bang, so it shifted over. Now, I don't mean a huge, great scenario. I just mean one or two little things, just a little laugh, the clink of a knife and fork, the something or other, just the whole piece would go, whoa. Now, he, if he was here, would say, yeah, that's right. And then the sounds just function as illustrations, don't they? They just becomes a comic book, doesn't it? And I would say a comic book's better than a nonsensical novel. At least it makes sense. And I think you have to accept the fact. Same with images. You know, when there's an image stream, the retinal data supersedes, overpowers the oral data. Because most of our data gathering is retinal. That's 70% that's of it comes from that. And, and it's backed up by, by our listening. So, but you can, you can control an image stream by reducing uh, the amount of new data that it's given you so that it verges on the edge of redundancy and increase the data flow, the new aspects of the sound stream, so that the two become much more equal. And that's one of the things that I try and do. So I'm not interested in cinema. I'm interested in controlling um, visual and oral data streams so that th th they reach more of an equilibrium. Um, and every situation is completely different too. I always thought that you could come up with a sort of a principle about this, but I don't think you can. Every situation is sort of a, a new guerrilla war, really. And you have to work out how to manipulate those those factors. So I, yeah, the idea of you know spectral morphologically getting stuck into a particular sound event and treating it a bit like um, you know Bartok or Beethoven would treat a little cell of material and producing all of its variants and so forth, or someone like Gao Ping, for example, you know that that I mean theoretically it should make sense. But then the problem is of using pitch-based material, especially the even-tempered scale, and instruments that are identical to the ones that were used by Beethoven and Brahms, you're still faced with this problem of, of uh, the, the pitch array pointing to something deeper, something beyond itself. And if it doesn't do that, if it stays just self-referential, and only that, adjacent notes changing, then I think there's a problem. It doesn't matter how clever you are, 